I think one of the things I enjoy about being uh, in this church is watching everyone contribute and do what they're called to do. I think you and I understand what it means to be a part of something bigger than us. Uh, some of you, maybe you're growing in your relationship with the Lord, and that's been a, a good journey up until this point. And you're probably wondering, okay, so how does my life become a life that God had created to be? Because for some of us, we have a, what we call the past, and some of us are still trying to move forward with that and trying to do our very best to become everything that God made us to be. But here's the good news. We serve a perfect God, so we don't have to be, which also can be the downfall because we can use that as a reason for us not to improve. But we're here tonight so that we can be equipped and discipled. Now, you have in your hand a paper that I think I forgot mine. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere. Okay, thank you, Bunny. Uh, and, and in this pamphlet, you're going to see the different areas, the different sessions that we have on our Wednesday nights. We have our Bible study, which is going to be going, you guys will be going through the book of Philippians. And your instructor will be Janelle Feldmeyer, located in the courtyard. And then a topical study uh, through prayer. And that will be with uh, Sheldon and Faye Karate in the fellowship hall. And they're going to be teaching that class. And then our foundations are for new believers. If you just came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then this would be the group that you would be in. And our foundations are actually going to meet right behind here in the backstage. So we have about uh, enough room for, I don't know, 35 people maybe. So if you're a new believer and you want to know more about the foundation of Christianity and your faith, then that's where you would be. Uh, I'm going to be in here for our regular Wednesday night service. So we have our Wednesday night service and then these different groups that can meet. For some of you, this is your first time and you're wondering, okay, so what do I do? Where do I go? Well, that's where you get to choose. You can look at this and uh, if you're a little apprehensive, you don't want to move, you don't need to. You can stay in here and then we will Actually, we're going to be talking about advancing the kingdom of God in here. And so for those of you who will be in the different groups, uh, you can catch this on online or through our New Hope app. That way you don't miss what happens on Wednesday night. So we will be recording uh, what is happening in here. Okay, everybody good? Okay, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to dismiss you so you can go to your various groups or just stay here. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for allowing us the privilege of learning from you and all of us put together is the church. And you have given us your word so that we would be equipped to do the work of the ministry so that the body of Christ could be edified. So tonight, may that happen, and may everyone receive from you every good thing that comes from you. You are a good God, and you give good gifts. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you can be dismissed if you're going to go in various groups. So back here, I believe it's Pastor... So uh, Pastor Charlie will be tonight. So you can go right through these uh, brown doors. Is it Pastor Charlie tonight, Pastor Lynn? Okay, it is. Okay, so while they're moving around, uh, those of you who aren't here, you can turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. If not, I'll read this scripture to us. So as they transition, you don't need to talk when you guys leave. We're still busy in here. But you can turn there in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. I'll tell you what is neat is that um, everyone has a place. You know, everyone has a place to go to and learn. So we're all going to learn together. And this is going to be a great season that we're in. So for the next maybe four weeks or so, we're going to be going through a series called Advancing the Kingdom. So get prepared for that. And uh, so when you come on Wednesday nights, bring your Bibles. Some of you have a uh, Bible app on your phone. You can bring that too. Uh, I like to use both. I have my, you know, what we call the regular Bible, the paper Bible. But I also have on my phone uh, at the same time. So that it's with me wherever I go. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 4, you can turn there. So let me just give you a, a, a brief uh, idea of what we'll be doing throughout this series. The, this series is going to teach us how 
We are the people who make this vision happen. The vision that God has called us to be as a church. The vision of reaching the lost. The vision of helping people find Jesus Christ. That's the vision of what we do. We say it like this. We reach the lost one relationship at a time. And that comes out of the Bible. We just summarized it so that we could remember. A couple of weeks ago, I went through the four circles of New Hope just to simplify who we are as a church so that everyone could get a, a, a vision of what we look like and how we can uh, implement the various gifts that God has given to us. And so those four circles is what we're going to be going through uh, these weeks so that we as the church can learn as, con as well as continue to meet new people and welcome people to the church, not just, you know, the staff or pastors or, or the volunteer leaders, because every person plays a part in the kingdom of God. Every person in God's kingdom, even the little things you do matter because everything we do is eternal. It's different than the ways of the world. See, when someone comes into a business and they greet you and they say, oh, welcome, do you need some help? That's as far as it goes. You help them, they buy something, and then the customer is satisfied, they pay for it, and then they leave. In the kingdom of God, when you greet someone, like on a Sunday morning or even a Wednesday night, for new people, when you greet them, you're greeting them in the name of the Lord. There is a difference because people will feel welcomed here. They will feel like they matter. They will feel valued. So these, these next couple of weeks that we're going to be together talking about advancing the kingdom is going to be all about how we as the church rise up so that we together can reach people for Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be equipped. God is going to equip us to do certain things so that his kingdom can be advanced. So Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 it says this, that he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we can see that God is going to equip us in different ways. There, there are five areas that God equips us. He gives that to us. We're all different, and all of us have, uh, we, we're all in this category. None of us, as a believer, don't fit this. All of us are in this category right here. Either we're going to be an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. But here, here's where we, we're learning, and I hope that many of us will catch this, that when the Bible says, that you are going to be an apostle or a prophet or evangelist or a pastor or a teacher, here are three fours, not four, I mean number, three fours, F-O-R. You have some pastors and teachers for what? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What we tend to see and we can have a tendency to become is that God gives us these gifts, whatever it would be, some type of ministry for us, whether it would be an apostle or prophet or, or pastor or teacher or evangelist, whatever that would be, and then we accept that and then that's all we do with it. We receive it and we say, wow, God, thank you for this gift that you have given to me. So I receive that and now I have it, but it's not for me, is it? And it's not for you. God didn't give you these gifts for you. The four circles that we talk about in, in our church, uh, the first one is our services. The second one is our small groups. The third one is serving. And the fourth one is stewardship. So our services are our Sundays and Wednesdays. And our small groups are our ministries, Bible studies, devotions, home groups, or activity groups. Our serving is... On, in church or outreach, whether it's uh, serving in the community or, or abroad. Uh, next year, actually this year, in May, I believe, we have a, a missions, uh, a Philippine mission trip uh, that a team is going to. And then stewardship, which is we invest in our spirit, our family, our health, our mind, our finances, and time. 
that God wants us to be wise stewards in these areas. And so these are the four circles of our church that we consist of. So tonight, we want to focus on this area called serving. Now, you may look at this word and say, serving, I do serve. But I, I want us to expand our vision when it comes to serving. Because some of us do serve. We'll, let's just say we serve in the kitchen or we'll set up or we'll serve in a ministry. We can have a tendency to forget why we serve, why we have these gifts, that it's not just for us. And if you're writing notes, if you're writing anything down or you want to take some notes, here's, here's something I want us to all remember. And if you want to put down number one, this would be it, that you are the vision of this church. If you want to personalize it, you just write down, I am the vision of New Hope Hila Hawaii. I am the vision. That you are the vision of the church. Now, people will ask, so what's the vision of the church? I can say it's to reach the lost one relationship at a time. And you can say, oh, wow, that's so cool that you guys reach the lost one relationship at a time. No, no, it's not you guys. It's we reach the lost one relationship at a time. You are the vision of this church. So we can serve in a ministry, but when we walk in these doors past hundreds of people that we never greet. You know what is interesting is that when Jesus gave us this vision of reaching people, he gave us this vision of reaching the world, he gave one word that meant action. You know what that word is? Go. That's the word that he gave us. He said go. I love when he says that. Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. You know why Jesus said, I will be with you even to the end of the age? Because we need him. It wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be, uh, it would make sense, even at that time, for Jesus to set everything up and give us the plan and then say, okay, go get them. And I hope you do well. Here's the plan. Here's a map. Here's how I'm going to build my church. And, and all you have to do is organize it this way. This is how you're going to reach the farthest corners of the earth. I, I can see the future. You will have these things called automobiles, airplanes. You're going to have ferries and boats that you can travel so you can reach the entire world. So you will be able to do this. You can reach people for me. All you got to do is tell them about me. You can go around the world through all of these ways of traveling. He could have done that. But we need him. We need Jesus. He said, go, therefore, and make disciples. That one word, go, means a lot. When you're playing Monopoly, go is good because you collect $200. Before, remember, I, 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 maybe if we have teenagers in here who don't have their license yet, you may not understand this to its full capacity. But for those of us who do have our license, remember before you got your license, you, you so eagerly wanted the license. And you're saying, come on, mom, come on, dad, I want to get my license. And then they said, okay, you got to study. You're going to have to pass the test. And then you're going to have to get good grades. Or, or maybe they put a stipulation to it. But all you knew is you wanted to get the license. And then they made a deal with you. They would say, okay, if you get the license, you have to be careful. You have to be cautious. You, you have to drive safely. And they said, okay, okay. And then you took the permit, you passed, you're excited, and then you could drive with another person that had their license, and so you're so excited, and, and so you're driving, and it's like, wow, this is so cool, I love this, and then after that, you took the driver's test in the car by yourself with the instructor, and you were nervous, and then you passed. And you're so happy to get your license. You took the picture. Yeah, you got your picture. You got your license. And now you can drive. And then when you're at home and your mom or dad said, oh, I got to go to the store and get milk. No, I'll go. I'll go, mom. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. No, I'll go. I'll go, mom. I'll go. What, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need from the store? We just got to get milk. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. No, you guys sit down. Relax. Enjoy. 
Okay, I'll go. You grab the keys, you grab your license, brand new license, yeah, mm, and you go in the car, you drive to the store, you get milk, you're all, you're happy. It's like, yeah, I got, I got my license. You get back in the car, you go home, you, get the, you give them whatever it was, and you feel good. And then the next day, someone needs to be picked up. Where are you going, mom? I got to pick up your brother from practice. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. Mom, I'll go. No, seriously, I'll go. I'll, I'll go. No, give me the keys. I'll go. You go, you grab your license. My license. Yeah, you go in the car, you drive. You see all your friends. What's up? Yeah, that's yeah, my car. And you drive and you go there, you pick them up, you come home, and you feel good about it. 20 years later. Oh, big difference, isn't it? Big difference. You look for that person who is new. Who says, I want to go. You say, yeah, go. Take the keys. Go pick up the kids. Go, go to the store. Buy all the groceries. You, you don't want to drive anymore. It's like we lost the passion to drive. Why? Because get crazy drivers. We, we, we don't want to drive in traffic. No more time. Or sometimes we just want to relax. Isn't it the worst that you want to cook something and then you no more show you? It's like, oh, no more eggs. I told you to raise chickens. We would have had eggs. And you, you feel like, man, I, I, I've lost that edge and that passion to want to drive. You lost the passion to go. I think and I wonder if we've lost that passion to go, therefore, into the world and reach people for Jesus. See, I think in the beginning when Jesus saves us, we're, we're excited and Jesus says, hey, I want you to go to church. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. I'll go early. I'll go early, get my favorite seat because some people take my seat and, oh, that rubbed me the wrong way. But I'll go early. I'll go early. I'll sit down. Oh, I love to worship you, Lord. Oh, look, everybody clapping. That guy not clapping. He get problems. Oh, I love worshiping you, God. I love worshiping you. I love it. I love it. I love it. And then time goes by. You meet some people. It's like, oh, it's so people are wonderful here. Oh, I love being around people. And then you hear a little bit of gossip and you're thinking, what? Really? No, not everybody, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know the pastor. He the worst. So you, and then people start talking. And then you develop these groups of people. And then you're sitting with groups of people. And then after a while, they become your friends. And you find friends in church. And that's a great thing. But then after a while, after years go by, when someone says, go meet that new person, go love on that person, go pray for them, we've lost that passion. And we've forgotten to go. And it could be because crazy people. It could be because I'm lazy. It could be because I just want to sit down and relax. Whatever the deal would be. But I hope that this word serving doesn't take us away from going. See, here's, here's my, my heart tonight that I want to communicate to all of us. And this is me included. That we would remember why we're here. That he gave some to be apostles some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, that we would be equipped for the work of the ministry, but not just serving, not just for the work of the ministry, not just for the edifying of the body of Christ, but so that we would love Jesus with what he has given to us. The gifts that he's given to us, the, the, the calling that he has on our life is not a means to an end. It doesn't end in itself. The, it, it goes on to edify the body of Christ. The reason why we have these gifts are not for us. It's for Jesus. It's to be used for him. You know, during Christmas time, I, I, I love, you know, when I, my grandchildren open up their gifts. They're just crazy. They're opening up the gifts. They don't even know what it is. They just open it. <gasps> wow, it's a something. And they're looking at it, and it's some kind of toy. And, oh, man, I feel horrible when the parents tell them, you've got to wait till you go home. Oh. Isn't that the worst? No, I'm speaking as a grandparent. I'm not saying bad as parents. I'm saying as a grandparent. Because I'm thinking, no, I'm going to sneak this toy out. I'm going to open the box and let them play with it and then put it back in and the parents won't even know. <laughs> because the, all the excitement to open up their gift and they can't play with it. Of course, I you know, respect the parents' rules. They get all excited and then they open up their gift and some gifts, some gifts, adults can play with it too. Some gifts. <laughs> like Nerf guns. Isn't it true that after a while, the kids are done with their toys and all the adults are playing with it, with the xylophone, bing, 
Bing, bing, bing, bing. Wait, wait, I get the song. Hang on. Ding, 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 ding. And so we, we play with their gifts. Or there's a remote control car. Let, let Uncle test them. Or an Xbox. No, 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 let me play this game. It's not, it's rated M. You know, can play this. <laughs> it's like we start playing with their gifts. And those gifts were not for us. The gifts that God gave to us are not for us. They're to edify the body of Christ. Can you catch that picture? He gave us these gifts, some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Not for us. It's not for us. It's so other people can come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. See, we all have been given a, a plan, if it were, a, a, a vision for our life from God. He gave that to us. And we're going to battle with that because it's hard. It's not easy. It's difficult. And Jesus said, in the world, you will have trouble. It's going to be difficult. But he said, but, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. In other words, even in a troubled world, we can do well. Even in a darkened world, we can do well. Because isn't it true that even in the dark, when you turn on a light, the darkness must flee? I would hope that we would never forget what Jesus called us to do and who he called us to be. He called us to be his greatest disciples, that he gave us his, the gifts that we have so that we can advance his kingdom. Mark 10, 15, it tells us, Jesus says this, I, I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So think about it. Wait, if we don't receive the kingdom of God like a child, we will never enter it. How is that even possible? I thought the kingdom of God was being saved. I thought the kingdom of God meant I pray, I come to church, I serve. What does the kingdom of God look like then? Because I, I, I thought that if I said yes to you, then I'm already in the kingdom of God. And although some of that is accurate, that he said the kingdom of God is already among you, it's, already, it's in you, that we can still be on the outskirts of the kingdom of God. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, you can't enter it. In order to enter something, that means you can be on the outside. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on the outside of the kingdom of heaven or even get into the kingdom of heaven and not do anything. See, I think I had this mentality in the beginning. If I can just know Jesus and get to heaven, I can do whatever I want. Because if I die, at least I go to heaven. That was my mentality. And then the more I fell in love with Jesus, the more I understood that this life never belonged to me. None of us can create our own air, breath. We, we can't do that. We can't pump our own heart. We, by the grace of God, are alive. That's why when we wake up in the morning, for some of us, we're like, thank God I'm alive. We understand that it's by the grace of God that we're still on this earth. But we're not on this earth for us anymore. Once we said yes to Jesus Christ, we're not on this earth for us. We're on this earth for him, for his sake. See, if we think, if we think that we're on this earth for us, then everything will be about me. We're going to collect everything for us. We're going to do what we want, when we want. We want our own comfort. And then we can come to church like that with all of our stuff. Like, no, this is all mine. This is all mine. This is my, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. This is my seat. My seat. My seat. My air, my air conditioning around me. I like this place. It's cool. I like this. No, it's, no hey, this, this, this is my kitchen. No, this is, this is my computer. No, no, this, this is my soundboard. No, this is my instrument. This is my TV. Oh, no, this is my door that I go through. No, this is where I serve. You just you serve with me. I serve in this ministry. You, we don't get along, so you, don't, you need to go. I may not say that, but we think it. And we think everything is ours. But it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Jesus Christ, and so do we. He paid for you and I with his life. You know how expensive you are? 
You know how valuable you are? You're so valuable that God gave his one and only son. But you know what makes us even more important on this earth than just being valued by God? Is the fact that we're still here. We're, we're still here. Which tells me you have someone to reach that I cannot. I have someone to reach that you cannot. If that person could be reached without you or I, we wouldn't be here anymore. We wouldn't have a purpose anymore. You think your purpose here is to do what you're doing now? Anyone can do what we do. Anyone can do what we do. With maybe if you're, if you're skilled at something, maybe somebody can learn it. But anyone can do what we do. Except reach the person we're supposed to. See, in God's timeline, that's our responsibility. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evan evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everything will come back to Christ. Everything is about Him. It will always be about Him because when we enter into heaven, guess who we're going to see there? We're going to see Jesus. But we're also going to see people. And God wants heaven to be flooded with people. Colossians 3, 17, 23, and 24, if you could turn there. The Bible tells us, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And whatever you do, in verse 23 and 24, and whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. See, in everything we do, we don't do for us. We do it for the Lord. And I know it can be, uh, it can be a challenge because we're thinking, okay, when I come to church or when I work or when I'm in the public's eye, you know, how do I know what I'm supposed to do? How do I know if I'm supposed to invite that person to church? How do I know if I'm supposed to pray for that person? How do I know if I'm supposed to greet that person? Well, you really don't. You, you actually don't. If you're waiting for God to say, greet that person. If you're waiting for God to say, you need to love on that person. If you're waiting for God to say, invite that person. It might be a microsecond too late. Because isn't it true that when you are going back and forth with, you know, teasing someone and you don't have a comeback, if you pause for a second, it is too late. You just, you just blew it. You, you, can't even, you have no power after that. That microsecond matters. Jesus already said, go. So why would we need to hear him otherwise? Why would we need to hear him say, go greet that person, go meet that person? Imagine if all of us, on a Wednesday or a Sunday morning, that that was our heart. Our, our mindset wasn't for us. That we said to the Lord, okay, you said to go. This morning, I am going to church. I'm going to go, and then I'm going to focus on someone I just met, or I'm going to focus on someone that I need to meet. Then I'm going to look for someone, greet them, and if they're sitting alone, I'll just say, hey, good morning, welcome to New York, Hill, Hawaii. Whatever it is, in some form or fashion, that you would go. You don't have to sit with them. You don't have to talk with them. You can actually start with just greeting them. And then maybe, who knows, maybe you know someone in church that you might see them. And then you say, hey, good morning. So good to see you. Hey, where do I know you? Oh, I know you from this and this and that or whatever it would be. See, some of us, that's what people did for us, but we, we didn't notice it. We just thought, wow, everybody is loving. Everybody's so friendly. No, they did that on purpose because they understood that they were a part of the body of Christ. And I'm sure many of us do that. We'll greet people in the morning, but I'm talking more intentional, not just serving and, and being here on Sundays or Wednesdays or whatever ministry we're in, but intentionally. I mean, I'm talking being a disciple of Jesus Christ, someone who's, who follows Jesus Christ to the point where when Jesus was among the crowds, he wasn't among the crowds. He was so fixed on an individual. 
He was fixed on individual people. If you're reading with us through our devotions, that's why that blind person was healed. Jesus was transfixed on him, and he, he came up to him. There was a whole crowd of people. There are many people who are sick. But Jesus was fixed on certain individuals, not because he didn't love everyone, but because he was intentional. And Sunday morning or Wednesday night, when you come to church, I understand your friends are here and we, we sit in our groups and we're with our people, and that's fine. I call them campfires. Next week, we're going to talk about that on how we can build campfires. A campfire is when you build a fire and you sit around to get warm or roast marshmallows or s'mores or hot dogs or whatever. You have a campfire. You have, if you have a small campfire, maybe, you know, five or six people can fit around it. You have this campfire, you're warm, and it feels good. And you can talk story with everyone. But then you see someone in the dark freezing. You say, hey, come over here. Come sit down. And then they come, they sit down. You see someone else. Oh, come sit down. After a while, you have like seven or eight people. You all can't fit. And you're all trying to squeeze into this campfire. But the wise thing to do would say, you know what? Okay, you know what? My friends... You know I love you guys. Yeah, yeah, I know you love. Yeah, yeah, okay. We've known each other for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You know what? These two new people, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take some of this fire and I'm going to start another campfire so that these two people can be warm. They're freezing. They're, they're on the outskirts. So I'll start this new campfire. I can see you guys. You guys are doing good. Yeah, we're fine. Okay. Start this next campfire so that these two people can be warm. And then they're going to see their friends. They're in the dark. Hey, come over here. Come by our campfire. Okay, good. Then we have about five or six people. And the next thing you know, we have seven or eight. And then we're saying, oh, my goodness, what? I, we need another campfire. And then maybe that new person who was new is now the other person who knows everyone. And they would say, you know what? I know you guys, right? Yes, I know you. Yes. You guys love me. I love you. Yes, yes, yes. We're fine. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start another campfire for these other people. So let me take some of this fire and after a while, you have campfires all over the beach where everyone is warm and everyone can be near the light. And then when we get to heaven, we won't need a campfire. God is the light of heaven. But until then, we need these little campfires. I want to give you a challenge tonight. That when you're here at church or in a ministry, wherever you serve, that you would look for campfires, but also potential campfires. That if you see someone sitting alone, or if you know someone who has been coming to church for a while and no one has ever reached out to them, no one has ever invited them to be, be a part of the ministry or whatever it would be, that you would step outside of your comfort zone and then you will go and greet them and say, hey, my name is Sheldon. What's your name? Oh, so-and-so. Yeah, I just wanted to invite you. You know, Tuesday nights we have this. Uh, Thursday nights we have this. Sunday mornings, you know, some of us eat breakfast. You want to come and hang out? I don't know you. No. Okay. <laughs> it happens. But imagine if they said this. <sighs> I've been coming here for years, and you're the first person to greet me because that has happened. And it has also happened where people have been coming for years and no one greeted them. We've had that happen. We were a church of this size, so it's bound to happen. We don't, we don't mean to do that intentionally. We don't, we don't mean to walk past people. We don't mean to ignore people. Some of us actually avoid people, but that's a different issue. But most of us, our heart is to reach out to people. We want to love people. And it takes a shifting of the mind. It actually takes a renewal of our minds to greet people we have never greeted before. I will never get offended if you walk right past me without telling me hi because there was a new person that you, ha you made a beeline for. And you said, I'm going to go greet this person. Why would I get offended? And I don't think you would get offended if I walked right past you because there was a new person. Unless you're new to me, then I would greet you. And then if I passed you, maybe you would get offended. But now we got to talk. <laughs> so let's just risk, for the sake of that new person, coming to know Jesus Christ. You're going to find that. You're going to find, what, what do I do? What, what decision do I make? I would say this. Uh, just some boundaries. 
because you might be thinking, oh, I can pick up chicks like that. No, no, no. That's not how we're going to do this. Believe me, that has happened before. That if you're a man, then you look for other men that you're going to reach out to, that you're going to invite to our men's ministry on Saturday mornings at 7 o'clock, things like that. If you're a woman, that you're going to invite women or, or befriend another woman. And we have our Saturday uh, morning women's group that they meet, I believe, at 6.30 or 6 o'clock, somewhere around there. Is it 6.30? Who goes there? 6.30, okay, thank you. But uh, you just think about how you're going to do this. It actually takes practice, you know. I mean, I don't know how, how, how many times a new person would come to church. They don't know who I am. So I'll walk up to them and say, hey, good morning. They walk right past me. They just walk right past me. And then I go to, an, an, unless they're not new. So I, I would just keep going. I would just keep going and then go greet someone else, greet someone else, greet someone else, and I'll try my best to do that. What we're trying to shift now towards is how we can help the new people. We have our connecting wall in our fellowship hall. And what I'm going to be doing on Sunday mornings is changing a couple of things. And we're going to try this for, for a season and see how this works. Normally when people receive Christ, I meet them at the bottom here, give them a Bible, pray with them. It is such a joy to see that happen. At the same time, I want to meet the new people that have been coming to church for a while that I have never met. Maybe they're trying to find a home church, whatever it would be. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our prayer team be our yes team. When people say yes to Jesus, then our prayer team would meet with them, tell them what salvation is all about, what receiving Jesus was all about, give them a Bible, and then pray with them. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to be in the fellowship hall by our connecting wall so that I can meet new people. And so we're going to direct new people towards our connecting wall in our fellowship hall. Now, many of you know this church like the back of your hand. You know where everything is. But we have new people that come here, and they step foot on campus, there, and they say, where do I go? Where, where do I go? And they have children with them. So we ask them, well, um, you want your children to be with you, or you want to take them to our children's ministry? And so we take them there. But we as the staff, and especially volunteers, can only do so much. Imagine if every single person welcomed people like you were the pastor of this church. Because he gave some to be pastors. Pastors take care of the flock. That's what it is. You're like a shepherd. You don't need a pastor's license to pastor people. You don't. You need a calling by God and a heart for God to take care of people. And imagine if all of us, when we saw people coming, for us, they may be new. And we could say, hey, good morning. Um, did you need something? you need some help? Oh, yeah, I was looking for where do I go? Well, this is where we worship. Come, let me show you. Imagine if you did that. And then they ask you, oh, so do you work here? No, no, I just come to church. Oh, so how long have you been coming? Oh, like six months. Really? So you don't work here? No. But you work for the Lord. In everything you do, in everything you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not for man, because it's from the Lord that we receive the inheritance. And then when everyone comes to church, it's not about the pastor. It's not about the worship singers or the people that are up here or the so-called leaders of the church. And although important for us to have that as, as taking care of people, we all rise up and become children of God so that we can edify the body of Christ. It's going to be tough to make those decisions, but you got to make them on the fly. Make those decisions before you have to. Think about it already. What, how am I going to be different? What am I going to renew? How am I going to be different when I come to church or, or out there in the community? What will I do different? And plan it already because it's going to take some practice. It's going to take some thought. And you're going to wonder, did I, did I do well? I don't know. Did I talk too much? Did I, I don't know. I don't know. Some time ago, I was doing a wedding, and this was on the cliff, uh, cliffside, and there's a fence. I think it's the uh, Sea Brewer, th that house up there. And it was just a beautiful view of Hilo Bay and, and just a nice day. And we're on there on the, uh, on the cliff, and so Heidi and I are kind of looking over. You can't really see the bottom, but you can see the ocean. And so we're standing there, and so I'm thinking, I said, Heidi, 
if this cliff were to crumble under our feet, which way would you go? Would you head that way and jump in the ocean and be safe because you can land in the ocean? Or would you run this way? Look for solid ground. She goes, oh, I'll jump, cannonball, boom. <laughs> I said, what? He said, oh, yeah, I would run and jump in the water. What would you do? I'm like, I'll look for a kind, solid ground. <laughs> now, if that actually happened, that's the difference between Heidi and I. If it actually happened, who would be right? We wouldn't know. We wouldn't know unless it actually happened. Maybe Heidi would be right. Maybe I would be right. But we won't know unless it actually happened. And I would say this. Come Sunday morning, this Sunday, there's going to be a cliff that's going to crumble beneath you in greeting someone, in welcoming someone, and just inviting someone to do something in ministry or whatever it would be, just befriending someone. And you can stand there and think, should I have met that person or should I have not? Would they have shut me down or would they have welcomed me? Did I, do I know that person well or don't I know that person? I wonder if I know their family. I wonder, I wonder if they're saved. I wonder how long they've been coming to church. You would never know unless it happened. Let's be people who advance the kingdom of God and go. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we understand what it means to go. That you gave us a commission. We call it the Great Commission. To go therefore into all the world make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything that you have commanded us. And lo, you are with us always, even to the end of the age. And you say that because we need you. We want to advance the kingdom, Lord. We want to be in your kingdom, but not just to be in your kingdom, but to advance your kingdom. That we would be people who intentionally look for people who may be alone or lost or, or maybe they're trying to find you. Maybe they don't have a relationship with you. We may be that last link to you. We may be that person that years down the road we will hear their story of, I wanted to give up. I wanted to end it all. I wanted to leave. I wanted to bail out. I wanted to take a shortcut. I wanted to forget about and maybe we could play a part in the redemptive story of a lost person finding hope because you equipped us some will be apostles that we will be people who take care of people who take care of people maybe there are people in here who will plant churches who oversee certain areas or who knows, Lord, but you've, you've called us to be apostles, people who will spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You called some to be evangelists, that we would evangelize, that we would go out into the world and tell people about you. Some of us can do it without even thinking about it. Some of us take practice. But you have given this gift of evangelism so that it can be used for you. You called some to be prophets, some that can encourage people and, and tell them about the hope they have in you, that their future is hopeful, that they don't need to bail out, but then to stick it through because you're the one that's going to help them through it all. And some pastors, that they take care of people. They love on people. They care for people. They check up on people. They'll call people. They'll visit people. They'll check on them in the hospital. And you called some to be teachers, that you've given them a gift to teach the Word of God. You've given them the ability to teach people who are far from you what it means to come into a relationship with you. You've, you've called some to be teachers that are able to teach well. It's, an, it's a natural gift. 
It's not difficult for them. They do it with ease because it's you who gave them that gift. You gave it to them. So I pray for all of us, Lord. We all are a part of this five-fold ministry as apostles or prophets or evangelists or pastors or teachers. All of us are in, in one of those categories. I pray that you'd breathe us to life and go and become everything you made us to be. We thank you for allowing us to advance the kingdom of God. May we do that intentionally. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said amen.